welcome to Power Factor, Power Factor fans. I'm Rick, and we just got uh, some interesting stuff for today. At least I hope it's interesting. Uh, I just came back from Renton Fishing Game where I shot the July club match uh, and had an interesting situation. We've had multiple episodes where we talk about the importance of reliability, the effect that malfunctions can have on a score, and that it's one of those things that you with maintenance and kind of checking things prior to matches, whether it's testing ammo with a new bullet or a new load or, uh, you know, re changing that recoil spring that's been in the gun for three years. There's different things you can do to help ensure reliability. And I had some last round feed failures at a match a couple of years ago, and it definitely impounded, uh, impacted, that is, my match score. Because uh, you're doing tap rack bangs, you know, trying to clear them. If it happens on two or three or four stages in a major match, it can really screw up your score. Anytime it can screw up your score. And I'd put some new mag springs in the gun and had not had any issues at all. They were, uh, uh, the, the problem that I felt I had was that, that because the springs were weak, I don't think they were great springs to begin with. And, and usually last round feed failures are evidence of weak springs. And uh, so I'd had a few, bought some extra long springs. Um, now the magazines are, have advertised capacity of 15 rounds, 17 rounds, uh, depending on the size of the base pad. This would be the 15 round configuration. These are for Browning High Power, but they're very similar to mags for uh, Beretta 92 and you know quite a few other high cap guns that don't have plastic mags. And I put mag springs in them, custom cut, uh, they were long enough, I think, that you could put them, uh, you know, in like an extended 20-round mag or something, and you could trim them to length. Well, I trimmed them down so that they would only allow 10 or 11 rounds in these mags, because I use them only for IDPA. So I figured there's no real reason to uh, to worry about the capacity. Let's just make sure that there's plenty of spring pressure in there uh, when they're loaded with 10 rounds. And the, the problem that I'd had with the last round failures was at the Washington State match in August of 2015. So we're coming up on almost two years that these springs have been in the gun. And I don't shoot it all that often, uh, probably two or three matches a year. So in the last two years, it's probably only been maybe 500 rounds through it. But today, I had premature slide lock while there was still one round in the chamber with all three of the mags that I took to the match today. And uh, of course the producer said, well maybe you're bumping the uh, slide stop up. You know, it's not the mags at all, it's not the gun, it's you know, user error kind of thing. And I did a little look-see. Um, you know, it's possible. Um, here's the gun, you got the slide stop uh, running along this side. And I am left-handed, but if you look, you can see there's you know, there's plenty of gap here. It's not like my trigger finger is rubbing um, on the frame. Uh, there's plenty of space there. And so uh, when, of course, I've got my mags numbered, which everybody should do, so that if you do have an issue with a mag, you know which one is causing the problem. And today I started with number one in the gun and then two and three on the belt. And I don't know if you should, you can see those two little tick marks on the base pad. So that's mag number two. And, uh, so I started running them one, two, three, one, two, three, and on the first, I want to say it was the first stage, of course in IDPA you do a lot of slide lock reloads, so if you have any issues with the last round, either last round feed failures, inertia feed, or the problem I was having, premature lockback, um, you're going to see it right away. So of course when it happened, I just thought, hmm, I don't really know what the issue is, it's never happened before, so maybe it was just an oddball situation, like the round had a burr on the rim. Um, you know, you never really know. If you're, especially if you're shooting hand loads, um, it's hard to make any kind of a determination from a single incident. But I still took magazine number one, rotated it to the back, put number two in front, so then I was shooting in two, three, one order, happened again with mag number two. So then, of course, then I'm starting to doubt that the issue is the mag. I'm thinking they can't all go bad at once, but I rotate the mags again. Now I'm using them in order 3, 1, 2, with 3 as the, uh, the load mag with 11 rounds in it. Happens again. So after not having any issues for two years, now I have premature slide lock problems with all three mags um, on the same day. 
And in kind of looking at them, these particular mags, factory mags, which are made by Metgar in Italy, have plastic followers. These mags are the so-called South African slash South American mags that you can get from uh, CDNN for cheap. And they have metal followers. And in just kind of playing with them, it looks like the follower, uh, under some circumstances, rises above the edge of the magazine tube right here. So rather than the follower being down below the tube, it's protruding up a little bit. And I'm starting to think maybe that's the issue, that even with the round in the mag, the uh, follower is coming up just enough to bump the slide stop. So I'm going to measure the spacing of the feed lips, compare them to a factory mag. Um, I bought some brand new uh, Mech, or, yeah, Mechgar manufactured, but they're factory uh, mouth, what are so-called mouse trap magazines? It's something we talked about uh, before. That uh, on the high power, uh, because of the magazine disconnect feature, the mags do not drop free. Usually, I've done a lot of work on these mags. I've applied uh, some dry film uh, lubricant to them, and they're really slick. And so when they're empty, they do drop out when the slide is forward. But usually if there's rounds in the mag or if the slide's locked back, they don't drop out. And so the mousetrap magazine fixes that by having a little spring-loaded metal uh, wire. Uh, and it looks like the little bail on a mousetrap, surprisingly enough. And so I'm going to measure the spacing of the feed lips on those and see if the problem isn't that the, the rounds are riding just a little too high in the magazine tube, and that's allowing that follower to rise up just enough to trip the slide stop. And of course, when you're shooting the gun in recoil, you've got some inertia effect or momentum effect maybe. When the gun's coming up in recoil, maybe just a little bump on the slide stop, even though it's not being pressed up into the slide, um, by the magazine spring, if that uh, follower rises up just enough to give it a little bump, it could kick it up there because a couple of times a tap, tapping on it caused the slide to go back into battery, which suggests it wasn't really all that securely uh, held, you know, that the slide was back, but just bumping the mag allowed it to go back into battery. So I'm going to check into that, but it's one of those things that when you've got an issue with your equipment, I certainly don't want to take this gun out or at least take these mags out without getting to the bottom of why was it happening. It didn't really hurt my score that much because it happens at slide lock. All it required is that when I ejected the mag and reloaded, it just meant that I had to fire one more round than I had planned. So on stages where I had a reload plan, say after 11 rounds, um, I'd fire 10, the slide would lock back, I'd reload and just have to fire three more rounds instead of four more rounds. Or, or, uh, and the only real issue, and one that can be a real issue, is it sometimes required that I in, uh, address the same target twice. Uh, we talked about it in loading to capacity. You want to try to not have to engage a target with one round, perform a reload, and then come back to that target again when you've got two rounds per target. There's a number of arrays today where uh, I, I had the opportunity to engage uh, two on T1, two on T2, three, four, five, and then on T5, instead of just putting two rounds on it and then leaving one in the chamber, I'd go three rounds on T5 so that when I got to the next target, I would have um, uh, two rounds left, or T5 would be 11 rounds. I'd shoot three on T4, that would leave three rounds in the, in the gun so that when I ran it dry, I would be in a transition between two targets. That's a terrible explanation of it. But anyway, if you look at the time it takes to, to address the target one round, bring it down, reload, bring it back up to the same target and fire again, and compare that to the time of a split that it takes to put three rounds on a target rather than two rounds, you're almost always going to be better off planning to have that reload fall between targets rather than in the middle of the engagement of one target. So the, the real cost of my having the slide locking back prematurely is that it messed up that timing, that I had that one round that I would have liked to have dumped, but instead I'm sitting there thinking, why is the slide lock back? Eject the mag, it rattles out, and then I go, oh, okay, it was a premature lock back, reload, finish the targets. And it didn't cause a huge issue 
so it wasn't that bad of a reload, but it's uh, one of those things where you just you want to avoid all of that stuff. And so the next time I shoot this gun, I, uh, I will either take different magazines or I will have tried to remedy the issue with these mags, fix them, test them before I take them to another match. Hey, Powerfight fans, I'm Rick. And I wanted to just, you know, do a little segment. I think most uh, competition pistol shooters of today are shooting straight walled pistol cartridges. You don't have to worry about trimming. Um, you use carbide dies that don't require lubing. Uh, but one of the guns that I shoot once a year in IDPA competition is a Luger. A uh, buddy of mine also has a Luger. And so we have an annual Luger grudge match. And the, my Luger is what, uh, again, you've got to endure a little history. Uh, my gun is what is called a 1920 commercial model. Uh, after World War I, the Versailles Treaty limited, severely limited the German arms industry. But one of the things that they did was crank out 30 caliber Lugers. And even though Americans were mostly familiar with the 30 Luger in the post-World I era for that reason, the gun was actually designed around a 30 caliber cartridge. And it's a pain to load. Here's a 30 Luger case. And the bottom part of it, the rim and the, um, the head dimensions are fairly similar to 30 Luger, even though this cartridge came first. But as you can see, it's got a short neck on it. And so, uh, like a necked rifle case, you have to lube the cases before you can load them. And then, like a necked rifle case, after you've uh, resized them a few times, the neck stretches a little bit, and then you have to uh, trim them. So, if you can imagine shooting, say, a USPSA or IDPA match, and then after every match, instead of just tumbling your brass to get it clean, you'd have to tumble it, resize it, wash it, because you've had to lube it, trim it, chamfer the case mouth, uh, you can see why I only shoot it once a year. Uh, one of the other issues with shooting, shooting 30 Luger is that the bore diameter, that is the groove diameter of the Luger is about 3095. And most 30 caliber bullets, rifle and pistol, um, are about 308 inch in diameter. So you can use 308 bullets. I think they tend to rattle down the barrel just because they're more than a thousandth undersized. What I do is buy bullets that are intended for the 3220 or 32 Magnum, which most manufacturers make in either 3.311 or 312 inch diameter. Now Lee makes a, a sizing die that's 309. And if I take my 311 diameter uh, Hornady 85 grain XTP, and run it through that 309 sizer, it comes out at 3095. So I've got my 30, and of course you have to lube the bullets before you size them. So in order to come up with 100 usable rounds, I have this sense that it's like loading, you know, center fire match ammo for my Garand or something where I'm lubing and sizing and cleaning. And then of course every case, I, I have such a uh, an attachment to it after all that work. I hate losing even one case. So when we're doing the Luger grudge match, I tell everybody in my squad, or I plead with everybody in my squad, while I'm shooting, will you please try to help me recover these 30 Luger cases? Because even though they're not really expensive, all the prep time and prep work, I really don't want to lose any of them. So I'll have an update for you. I'll show the Luger. I know you want to see the Luger. There are a few Luger specialists um, they're few and far between now. I think John Martz is probably the best known. Uh, he was in California and he passed away fairly recently. But my buddy's got a 36 Mauser uh, that was fully restored by John Martz. And it's a beautiful gun. I mean, it looks like it's brand new. It's absolutely perfect. But, of course, he paid an arm and a leg for it. This gun was, uh, the restoration work was done um, by John Lawson, who is... Uh, He's probably not that well known today. He's uh, he's in his 80s, but he's been operating a gun uh, business, gun smithing business in Tacoma, Washington. I think since 1946, called the Sight Shop. So I think he's still in business. If you look him up, the Sight Shop, Tacoma, Washington. But he's a Luger specialist. 
uh, uh, John restored this for me about 15 years ago. He did a rust re-blue on it, re the small parts, and the really important thing he did was a trigger job. Um, if you are not a big fan of the squishy um, striker-fired triggers of today, uh, the Glock trigger is a is a, just a marvel compared to a, an original Luger trigger, but uh, John Lawson was able to do a trigger job on that gun. It's really nice, about three pounds, nice and crisp. Uh, makes the gun really easy to shoot. 85 grain bullets at 1,100 feet per second. There's almost no recoil. Lugers are known to be extremely accurate. I mean, the, the sights are small, but if you can see them, small sights give you real precision. They're not fast, but if you're shooting 15 yards, 20 yards, um, with a good trigger, Luger's a pretty nice shooting gun. So I'll report back, tell you how many cases I lost. But uh, yeah, it's a fun time. So just another little you know wrinkle Luger competition. I don't think it's going to take off. But uh, with the new um, not for competition rules in IDPA, just tell your match director, hey, I've got a 30 caliber Luger. Barrel's too long for bug. Caliber's too uh, small. But hey, NFC, can I shoot it? Shouldn't be any problem. Have fun.